I'm Ali Patterson and welcome to the FinTech Show. Now, lately, we've focused a lot on the technological offensive of companies across the globe as they add faster services and solutions to their arsenal. This week, we're taking a look at their defenses, more specifically, cloud-based security. So we're joined by iBoss, who provide business secure internet access on any device in the cloud. We also sit down with Starling to discuss the Challenger Bank's defenses against cyber fraud in 2019 and beyond. Cloud security is fairly new, so it's been around for roughly five to 10 years. Uh, the original cloud designs were what we call Cloud 1.0, and it was designed on a monolithic architecture uh, where everything flows through a central cloud. The newer clouds are what we call Cloud 2.0 are based on containerized architectures. And that containerized architecture allows the security to reside across multiple different clouds, so a micro cloud technology approach. The result is that you can apply security policies to the applications you're leveraging in the cloud in a more granular fashion. So move your security policies that were once on appliances to the cloud without having to sacrifice how you apply security. Now, can you tell me a bit more about cloud sacrifice? What does it mean for these institutions that are grappling with getting on the cloud? Cloud security provides a lot of benefits. The scale, the elasticity of the cloud, the ability to secure a user from anywhere. The second question that usually comes up after the fact is, how do I move all the security policies I have in my appliances into this cloud architecture? And where do I have to sacrifice? And typically when you move into a cloud 1.0 or monolithic cloud, it requires you to sacrifice things like your IP, your IP visibility, which means how do I simply restrict access to a certain uh, application in the cloud based on where the user is or how the user's accessing the cloud? Fairly basic in an appliance, but very difficult in a cloud 1.0. So cloud sac sacrifice is basically when I move to the cloud, do I have to sacrifice how I operate my environment? What are my policies uh, for security policies in the cloud? And even how people access the cloud. So as a very agile bank, what was the journey to cloud like for Starling? Well, we had the advantage that we were born in the cloud. So we didn't have that transition that the incumbent banks have got. But it wasn't necessarily that straightforward. No one had done it before, so we were the first. So we had to work out what exactly we had to do to make it right. So there was a lot of um, thinking about how we were going to do things, how we were going to meet all the regulatory requirements, how we were going to meet all the requirements we had just to act as a business. So there was a lot of thought and preparation before we set off on our journey. But as I say, we had the advantage of the fact we were born in the cloud, so we didn't have to make that transition from legacy systems to what we've got now. As you were born in the cloud, as you said, you haven't had that journey. But for the more traditional banks who are taking that journey, is that potentially a dangerous time for their customers' data, or is it a bit more complex than that, and it's, it's a slightly dangerous time in general for customers' data? I think as long as they're preparing and they're thinking it through carefully, I don't think there's any more additional risk. It is new technology, but it's the same risks. It's just manifesting themselves in a different way because they're presented to them through a different form. I think if they've taken the time to think about it like we did when we started, I think they can make it as secure, if not more secure, than it already is. Can you tell us how has fraud changed over the last couple of years and how do you protect your customers' data and even payments data while on the cloud going forward? I think the huge increase in the amount of data that's available has made it a target. The fact that it's now available through many different means due to new technologies means that it has become a really valuable asset and it is used as you're implying to, uh, to facilitate fraud. Again, we have to um, make sure that we're vigilant at all times across all of our platforms, across all our technologies. Um, it creates great opportunity, but it does mean that we have to be aware of all of the risks and the threats to all of the data across the board. Excellent. And so how do you use potentially AI technology to engineer against social engineering types of fraud? So we're able to take um, a lot of data, such as metadata about our data and how it's used, and use that and feed that into um, AI and machine learning algorithms to detect anomalies. So that's a great advantage. And again, the cloud gives us the power to do that at scale. So we're able to monitor a lot more than we would have been able to on traditional systems because we've got the ability to plug it into all sorts of different systems, um, analyze that data, work out what's being used where, when something's not right, we're able to go and look at it in more detail and, and actually drill down on that and find out what's going on. So with that in mind, let's take a closer look at our interviewee's implementation of cloud security. What we're seeing is a lot of the more small agile organizations 
uh, as they move data into the cloud, and they've already moved their applications to the cloud, they're moving most of their security in the cloud, uh, what you really want to do is ensure that they can apply the same security policies that they retain when they had their on-premise equipment. So things like IP uh, restrictions in the cloud, uh, ensuring that only the uh, authorized user can access uh, cloud data, that's the, uh, the application in the cloud, when they're on, for example, their own, uh, the corporate owned device versus a personal device, uh, to ensure that one, they're meeting compliance, but two, that they're not uh, you know, accessing your data with an infected personal device, right? So those, they seem like small nuances, but it actually makes it a lot easier to apply security when you can actually apply all the, you know, this, the same security postures that you had with your on-premise equipment when you moved to the cloud. How critical has fighting cyber fraud become now that data is effectively being called its own currency? I think what it's manifested itself because of the amount of data. I think we are having to fight not only traditional fraud, but cyber fraud because one's being used for the other. So as we have an increase in um, the amount of data that we've got and we use, we're having to make sure we protect that because it's being used to commit traditional fraud in the ways that we've seen it before. So we're getting a sort of a double whammy. I think the ubiquitous availability of it and the fact that the cost is fairly low means that we can deploy it at scale. So we're able to use new technologies that can analyze metadata and data to make sure that we are detecting these fraudulent activities much more quickly is great and that's what cloud provides us. What we did at iBoss is really grabbed the concept of security in the cloud and leveraged a containerized gateway architecture, which allows us to live and cohabitate across multiple different clouds. So we can protect the data as it resides and it's being accessed by your users remotely, but do so in a more native path. So it's securing the data where it resides in the cloud. We've been able to do things like a lot of automation, um, a lot of infrastructure as code, which allow us to be consistent, but also very quick. The automation also means that we can free up resources to do other things, which means our over overall costs are lower. Incredible. And how has that really impacted how uh, an institution like yourself can look after your customers' data and potentially protect and increase the security of your customers' data going forward? We've been able to implement controls a lot more consistently um, across the board and once we've done it once we know it's working, we can keep testing it in an automated fashion as well. So it allows us uh, a lot more confidence in what we're doing because we know that we've got it right and we can keep consistently checking that it's right. And being in the cloud just gives us all the tools that we need to be able to do that. Where do you see cloud technology going in the future? And are some of these incredible kind of stories going to finally become use cases? It's the future. There's really you know, the, the old brick and mortar, four walls, putting appliances inside your organization to protect user data doesn't even make sense. The data is no longer there, so there's really nothing to protect. Users are everywhere. They're accessing your, your data from clouds that are across, you know, multiple different clouds. So protecting the users accessing data in third-party clouds is the reality that we live in. And what we're gonna see in, is an evolution around cloud security that becomes more granular. It provides more control, more visibility, and ensures that the security policies that are specific to each organization can be, can be applied in a very more seamless fashion. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Fintech Show. Be sure to watch the rest of our series over at fintech.finance. See you next time.